Well, greetings. Thank you for joining us. Today I'd like to talk to you about um, a post that I read on uh, Facebook. It was from um, Gala's Magazine. I met um, the author Gala Holly um, last week at Ron and Sharon Knott's home church in Euless, Texas, um, where Gregory Holly was the keynote speaker. And afterwards, I, you know, had a very wonderful conversation with Gayla, and she <laughs> is one of the few people that I've met who is actually active on social media. Uh, now, she has a, a um, blog on Facebook called Gayla's Magazine, and she posted, we have become so self-centered that we go to God only for something from him and not for God himself. It is like saying, no, Lord, I don't want you. I want myself. But I do want you to clean me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to be on display in your showcase so I can say, this is what God has done for me. Gaining heaven, being delivered from sin, and being made useful to God are things that should never be a consideration in real surrender. Genuine, total surrender is a personal, sovereign preference for Jesus Christ himself alone. And I absolutely agree with that, 100%. What I would add to that and in my response to um, her post is that as a believer in Christ, which is what I am, I am not a Christian. I am a believer in Christ. I'm following Jesus Christ. He is my God. He is not part of a trinity because my Bible tells me that in him, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit that lives within me, is the Spirit of Christ. Jesus came as a man. When he left, he said, I'm going to be gone, but then I'm going to come back to live with you. The Spirit that lives within Spirit-filled believers, born-again believers, is the same Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ are one and the same. It's just a different name. Just like we used to say Holy Ghost. Those of us who grew up reading the King James Version. So I didn't want to clarify that. But the dedication and level of commitment required for a believer in Christ to die to self is immense. I will not make light of the fact that it is something that we have to work on every day because every day an opportunity arises where we would want to um, do things our own way. We would want to be selfish about some of the things that we do that and may not seek God's advice about what it is that we ought to do and what his will for us is. But once you make that decision, I mean, really, when you have made that decision and there is no turning back, it's a journey that takes a lifetime. But the benefits, <laughs> the benefits from the Lord are so great and they are readily available to you. They're already available to you. But on those days when you feel weak and you feel like, and I mean, sometimes a weakness is, you know what, I don't even feel like getting up out of bed today. Not because you're, you know, tired or sick or, or anything like that. You just don't feel like it. But there is something, some work that God has called you to. And he can strengthen you to just roll on up out of bed and work on whatever it is that he's asked you to do. You're empowered 
to do whatever God asks of you. And I use the word ask kindly because God really doesn't ask us to do anything. He commands us. He tells us. It's like a parent tells his children or in the military, your colonel doesn't ask you private to do something. When he's telling you private, go so and so and do such and such, he's not asking you, he's actually telling you to do it. It's a commandment. And you're expected to follow the commandment or find yourself facing some consequences. And generally in the military, it's pretty instant. And God will encourage you to do whatever it is that you need to do. He doesn't just tell you to do something without encouraging you and letting you know that, hey, I'm, I'm right here with you. You are not doing this alone. When you say, I can't do that, I don't have the skills, I don't have the fortitude, I don't have the whatever, the mentality, I don't have anything. And he says, you, you're not going to be doing it alone. And in reality, it is him that worketh in us the will to do. He's already, God's never asked us to do something. He's not already given us the ability from the inside out to accomplish. That's the first thing that we need to understand. So he can encourage you by telling you, remember back, you know, a year ago when I, you know, I told you to do such and such. And you'd be like, yeah, I remember that. And you and you're like, and what happened? Oh, well, you know, so, 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 so. And did you do it? Yeah, you know. So we are encouraged because of the things that God has already brought us through. And that's the way we need to look at it. So to begin with, those are the basic things that he strengthens, empowers, and encourages us. Those are the basic things that he does for us whenever we embark on a new assignment. But the journey of dying to self, and there comes a time when self just really does get buried and forgotten, <laughs> you know. Don't get raised back to life like some zombie. You know, people who are, you know, it, it, it that doesn't happen. I mean, it, it rears up, but you beat it down until it's gone. Now, when we, we face the challenges, we're going to face challenges. We're going to face a lot of challenges, but most of those challenges are going to come from within. It's going to come out of our own heart, our own thoughts, and our own will to do things our own way. Those where most of the challenges are going to come from. They're not going to come from the outside. But you choose victory. If you choose victory, it's yours. And it can be implemented in your life because the price that, has, that was paid for our complete and total victory, that was already paid. We have to live up to it. We have to believe it. We have to embrace it. Now, the Bible tells us in the last days that men will be lovers of themselves. And if you reference uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, it tells you that men are going to be lovers of themselves. They're going to be ungodly. They're going to be selfish and a whole a plethora of other things that are going to come along with it. And it all comes down to the point where as Christians there is you'll have a form of godliness that means you go to church you may read the Bible you may even quote your Bible you may even post your little cookie cutter oh God loves you God's wonderful all of those little cute pictures and nice scriptures that we post but we don't believe it because we'll post that picture and then you know a couple hours later or a little bit down further on down you see a post about oh how sad and sorry you are or how you feel this and you feel that but it's it contradicts the very word of God so you those are the people who have a form of godliness and do, and deny the power thereof those are the people that hinder other people from believing what the Bible actually says. Because there's always someone watching your life. There's always someone who is paying attention to what you're doing. And when you are not living up to those scriptures that you quote, 
and the office that you have around your desk and you know all over the place on your little coffee mugs and, and all these things like that when you're not living up to that people notice they notice that I'm not going to be before you long with this but I did want to address it because it is important excuse me in real life people take drinks <laughs> um but I'm going to get back to Galos Magazine, and I do encourage you that if you're on Facebook to look her up, and it's G-A-Y-L-A apostrophe S Magazine, Galos Magazine, a beautiful and anointed woman um, that I am very comfortable sharing the posts and the messages. Uh, she actually... <laughs> encourage me to get in front of the camera. I have my only issues about being in front of the camera. I don't mind recording. Um, and I don't even like the, the sound of my voice. But I want to speak plainly and succinctly to you about the state of the body of Christ. We've got to bring about some changes. This is the second, actually the second video and podcast that I made today. And um, I shared on the last one and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sharing this for a while and we're going to actually get into talking about it that I heard in the spirit um, over this past week after prayer that, and the, I heard the Lord say clearly, judgment. Judgment is coming. Judgment begins at the house of God. And I was at the home church of um, Sharon and Ron Knott in um, Euless, Texas. And we had two speakers. And back to back, they both said the same thing. Judgment begins at the house of God. And I had an opportunity to talk with one of them um, after it. And I was telling him, I said, wow. I said, when the we were sitting talking uh, after his session, and then the other speaker was speaking, and she said the same thing. And we had just talked about that. And we turned around and looked at him, and it's like, that's three times, three times that I heard that. And I think that it is very important that we understand that when God speaks to us, whether we're reading a scripture or we're hearing a message or we hear it, you know, during prayer, when God speaks to us, and then we hear that same thing again, we need to pay attention. If you are not in, come to the place where when you hear it the first time, you act. When you hear it that second time, you better start moving. And if you hear it a third time, you know that it's absolutely what's going to happen. And God is trying to get your attention and tell you that. So I just want to, I'm going to go ahead and close on this right now. Um, but there was, uh, after that, I responded to Gayla about um, the commitment that's required to die to sin. She actually came back and says, we need our Father in Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit more than ever before. She says, make us hungry for you, Lord. And that's her prayer. Um, I think that right now today if you're not hungry because Jesus said you know blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled and there's something that the Lord showed me about that particular uh, <laughs> passage of scripture Matthew 6 is a very very powerful I mean it's a powerhouse right there within itself um, but if you're not hungry for the things of God, what happens when you don't 
have a taste for something. At some point, you no longer desire it at all. So a lot of people are facing that. That they've been without it for so long that they don't recognize how good it is. Because it really only gets better and better. So, I thank you all for your time. May the Lord bless you. And may you be strong in the Lord and stand firm in your faith.